Oh, hello again. You, how lucky am I and me in the same place? What are the odds? Welcome back to Bumblebee. Today, we're gonna take a trip down Yuck Lane. So grab your lozenges and get ready to call in sick tomorrow. I'm Taylor McWaters. Here are the top 10 messed up things in the life of a plague doctor. Big nose guys, let's talk about them. Number 10. Patient examination. Ah yes, nothing more relaxing and ensuring than Birdman giving you a medical checkup. Hey, watch the beak, pal. Jeez. Mm. Plague doctors were often the first line of defense against disease, all the diseases. They would visit the homes of suspected plague victims to determine whether they indeed had the big P. Prominent symptoms were these painful, swollen lymph nodes that appeared in the groin. Yeah, gotcha, psyched you out there. A little obvious, you're gonna wanna call Birdman right away for all that noise, all that junk down there. Other areas that would get infected would be your armpit, your neck, your back, or your crack. Everywhere you see boils, call in Birdman. Other symptoms included fevers, chills, and gangrenous patches on the extremities, often referred to as God's tokens. You're like, oh cool, thanks man, awesome, this hurts a lot. So stupid. Yelling at God, it's already number 10. Number nine, treatments? Yeah, I put a question mark after that one because, uh, yeah, well, you'll see. Medical treatments in the 17th century was not nearly as advanced as we are today. Not even close. A lot of their knowledge was based on the humoral theory of medicine, which spread the belief that the body contained four humors. You had black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. Yuck, the infinity stones of grossness. So many treatments aim to rebalance these humors. Bloodletting and the application of leeches or frogs to the infected areas, this was a common practice, believe it or not. Yeah, you go in with bronchitis and you leave with a pet frog. You're like, nice, this should work, right? <laughs> walk off. Those walk offs feel so <laughs> quiet and weird, but I do them for you. They do them for, even the editors are like, God, this is so <laughs> quiet and weird. Quit screwing around. Other treatments, albeit less scientific, less froggy, included the application of crushed gemstones. All the gem girls watching are like, yes, I knew it, I told you. Or pigeon poop to the swollen areas. A lot of yuck, let's move on. Number eight, record keeping. This guy was your family doctor, this bird man. How scary is that? Plague doctors were responsible for maintaining records of the infected and diseased. Now this documentation was vital for city records, understanding the spread of disease and then determining the magnitude of outbreaks. This is important, right? We know a little bit about this, of course. They didn't have Fox News back then, so these dudes had to set the records straight. Literally, they had to set these records straight. These records also played a role in quarantining homes. As Properties with the infected individuals would often be marked with a painted sign or a piece of cloth. Or, you know, stay away from here, essentially. As long as they don't cover their lawn with plastic flamingos, we're good, you know? If you know, you know. Let's move on. Number seven, conducting autopsies. At the time, 16th and 17th centuries, conducting autopsies were a controversial practice, often opposed by religious authorities. Yeah, I can imagine this practice would make many uncomfortable, especially the doctor when he looks like a DC villain with a massive beak. In reality, only a small amount of plague doctors actually conducted autopsies on plague victims. Just a few, just a few weirdos. The aim was to gain a better understanding of the disease by observing its effects on internal organs. Obviously, we know this now. Which is weird because today we use a frog. We dissect a frog in high school. Back then they were so close. They had the frog, they had all the info, and they're like, eh, magic. Figure it out yourselves, I don't know. Number six, public health recommendations. Are we all six feet apart for this next one? Good, great. Plague doctors advised municipalities on preventive measures. They would call in, they'd recommend the isolation of the sick, the burning of the contaminated possessions of the sick, and the cleaning and airing out of homes. Quarantines were often established in an attempt to contain the spread, with ships sometimes being held at anchor for 40 days, which actually gave birth to the term quarantine. It comes from the Italian word quaranta, meaning 40. Yeah, we're learning history and language today. How fun is that? Number five, protective clothing. All right, let's address the elephant in the room. Why is my family doctor dressed like a scary bird? What's the deal here, guy? What's with the beak, pal? The iconic bird-like mask was filled with herbs like rose petals, juniper berries, or myrrh, all that kind of stuff, just stuffed in. Anything that would be on a Thanksgiving table, just, here you go, just tape that to your face. That's your N95, good luck. This was believed to protect the doctor by filtering out toxins from the air. Toxins thought to carry the big bad disease. Long waxed leather coat, the leather gloves, the Gene Simmons boots, and the wide brimmed hat, these were all part of their attire. They served as barriers against contact with the infected. And again, they looked pretty badass, so 
It all fits. Number four, educating the public. During the 17th and 18th centuries, the understanding of disease was of course vital. And misconceptions were all too common. Huh, imagine that, in that time, who would have thunk? In such a time, plague doctors took on a crucial role in spreading information, often doing so through public addresses, leaflets, or even one-on-one -on -one interactions. It's gotta be intimate, all close to his beak, he's like, stay inside. You're like, you got it man, please don't kill me. Despite a limited understanding of the disease's transmission, there was a general consensus on the benefits of cleanliness. So doctors encourage regular washing, boiling drinking water, and the cleaning of homes, especially the removal of waste, which could otherwise rot and release foul odors into your, you know, your eyes and your mouth. Now plague doctors, they don't like that. They're not a big fan. So take out the garbage tonight, okay? Help out the wife at home. Prevent the plague from coming back in or else Birdman's gonna yell at you. Help out at home. Just disappear. You're like, who was that guy? Who was that? Number three. Sanitary inspections. The belief that diseases would spread through bad air, that's what they called it, bad air. This belief influenced many health policies during these centuries. So plague doctors, often accompanied by local officials, they would inspect public areas like markets, inns, and even churches. Yeah, middle of grocery shopping, this dude would come in and start poking around your produce. Not jarring at all? Sure. These inspections, of course, included home inspections, especially those in crowded urban areas. Those were a major concern for the birdmen, all right? These inspections, would check for overcrowded living situations, stagnant water, accumulated waste, or decaying matter. Anything bad and yucky, not great. Houses found in unsanitary conditions would be ordered to clean up, and sometimes under the watchful eye of authorities. Yeah, the authorities would tell you to clean your room. How amazing is that? I always thought my mom was lying growing up. She's like, I'm gonna call. You gotta clean, I'm gonna call. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna quick call. Number two, counseling and spiritual advice. Any Libras out there, hit that thumbs up. It's our season, right? For like four more days, it's our season. The emotional and psychological toll of the plague was immeasurable, right? We have a little lick of understanding about that. With death just lingering about for decades, many struggled to cope with the loss of loved ones or the everlasting fear of infection going through the bad air around you. So the solution was to send in the scary plague doctor and tell you everything will be okay. Plague doctors, despite their primary medical role, they found themselves consoling grieving families or individuals in their last moments. They would offer words of comfort, sometimes drawing from religious or philosophical texts, or they would merely provide a listening ear and a beak. They would also provide a listening beak. Imagine this guy for your last words. How terrifying is that? In the face of such widespread despair, the line between physician and therapist would sometimes blur. And this guy would be right in the middle. Times were grim, brother. That's all I can say. It's really the worst case scenario. You'd see this guy and not your family. That was your way out of death's door. Many doctors wrote about the emotional challenges of their role in private letters or journals, expressing their feelings of helpfulness, frustration, and sorrow. And finally, number one, bird police. As gentle as these plague doctors could be in your most tender last moments, they could also be absolute narcs. Yeah, they could ruin your day completely and shut you down. Coordination between plague doctors and local authorities Authorities, this was crucial in fighting back against the plague. So plague doctors would work alongside city councils, they would advise on the latest developments in the outbreak, whilst also recommending courses of action to immediately follow. This guy ran the ship. Their knowledge would set up the regulation of public gatherings or the inspection of incoming goods and travelers. Border patrol and doctor, the scary guy, love it. Wherever you go, you're gonna see a lot of beaks. A major step in history, I mentioned it earlier briefly, the plague doctors were vital in the establishment of pest houses which today we call them quarantine stations. A little bit better than pest houses, I think. Yeah, sounds like a bug-filled house. I don't want to go in there at all. Travel restrictions were also another critical measure. These restrictions would be imposed based on plague doctor's advice. Yeah, I can't go to Mexico this year, guys. Old Birdman said nay. He said nay, I don't know, that's it. Roads leading in and out of afflicted areas would be closely monitored or sometimes even shut down entirely, and ships would be inspected before being allowed to dock. All this to say, plague doctors look silly, but they didn't and fuck around. We can blur that. Nice going. I'm Taylor McWaters, being you, and we'll see you next time in, in the hive. See you next time on Bumblebee. See ya. I'm gonna go put my beak on.